Hey everyone, welcome in the fifth episode of my monthly CX update. Thanks for watching the show. I'm sure you're going to enjoy the topics of this month. Welcome. Customer experience in times of high inflation. This is probably the question I got most of the time in the past few weeks and months. Stephen, how, how do we need to deal with this situation you know, where customers have less money to spend or where people are watching their money closer and are thinking more in depth about which products they will buy or will not buy? How do we deal with this in terms of customer experience? And in my opinion, there's a, a short run answer and there's a long run answer to this question. Um, reality is that in the short run, a lot of companies are really looking for short term measures to keep their situation safe. And very often that has an opposing interest for the customer. Like one of the consequences, of course, that we see a lot of price increases in many industries. Now, the question is, how do you deal with that? Uh, in some industries, you don't have another choice than to increase your prices or you go out of business. Um, I think three things are really crucial if you need to increase your prices. Um, it needs to be very transparent, where you tell the real story to your customers um, about the situation and how you will increase prices. I think you need to be proactive and honest. Uh, it shouldn't be a surprise. It's better to warn people up front, to tell them what's happening. Be very open in your communication about the reasons why you are increasing the prices. And the last one is, is often overlooked, but brief your team about this storyline. Uh, people on the floor might get a lot of complaints, may get a lot of questions from customers who are complaining about the fact that prices are increasing. If then the team is like, yeah, I know, it's something the boss decided. If that is the answer, that doesn't bring anything or value to the customer. The team needs to be aware of the storyline. The team needs to bear, be aware of the reasons why and, and share that story with the same conviction as someone else in the organization would do. And that kind of on the floor communication from employee to customer, that can make a huge difference in the way that it is perceived. So the last one, brief your team. I think that is the most important one that is very often overlooked in customer experience strategies at, the, at this time. And of course, you know, there, there's always an opportunity for other companies. Some, some companies are not increasing their prices. And I think it's smart if you are in that situation to actually communicate about that. Like, most of you know that I'm a fan of Club Rouge. We became eight for the 18 time Belgian champions in, in Belgian soccer. But for next season, they announced that they will not increase the prices of the annual tickets. If you want to buy an annual ticket, you have your subscription, you have a ticket for every game. They don't increase the prices and they actually communicate that in a very formal and a very loud way, which I think is a smart strategy to do. So going back to how to deal with you know, price increase or with uh, inflation in customer experience, price increase is one part of the story. Another thing that a lot of companies are going through right now is cost cutting. We need to save money to protect our margin. Very often cost cutting is happening in customer service at this time. So if you need to cut costs in customer service, how to do this in a smart way? And I just want to come back to the, to the book that I talked about last month, Moments, The Power of Moments. I think we need to use this strategy today if you downside the cost of customer experience. The, the story of the book is very simple. They actually say that if you would measure every single interaction that a company, that a customer has with your company, you know, the, the average score may be 6.5. But if they have, you know, a number of interactions that are really, really outstanding and surprising and positive, the overall feeling gets to a 9 or a 9.5. And I think this is a strategy that we need to take into account. If we cut costs in customer service, really think where are we going to create a positive surprise? Where are we going to have this one moment that is conversational, that is worth a word of mouth afterwards in a positive way? And if you choose those moments in the right way, you can actually improve your word of mouth afterwards while you're decreasing your costs in other places in the customer experience. I think that's one side of the story. The second one, of course, if you need to cut, cut costs on customer service, optimize self-service. Uh, make sure that people can figure out how to solve problems themselves. One of the best examples that I still know in, in the world out there is by Coolblue, a Dutch e-commerce company. 
what they do is they constantly monitor the kind of questions that come in their contact center. And for repetitive questions, they make a video that actually solves that problem. So they make hundreds and thousands of videos. You know, every week they post videos to explain things, to help people choose between product A or product B, or how to install a new TV, for instance. And they share these videos to customers who actually bought a product that is related to the question that they may have. And these thousands of videos, you know, at today they have one, more than 130 million views with all those videos. And this is some sort of a self-service channel that they created that works perfectly to help people and is reducing the amount of calls that are coming into the contact center. So for the short run, these are just some of the ideas that I wanted to share. If you have to increase your price, brief the team, do it in a transparent and proactive way. Cost cutting, I understand, but then think about the moments. What is gonna be the crucial moment where you still create this moment of happiness? And how can you improve your self-service in a digital way? And if you don't increase prices, just say it to people so that they know. That's a, that's a short run game. If we think about the long run, how to deal with customer experience in a world of high inflation in the long run, then this is for me the crucial question. Are you willing to hurt yourself as a company in the short run to win trust in the long run? Are you willing to you know, go through some pain right now to keep the relationship with the customer strong? And I, I just want to use my offer you can't refuse model to explain my point of view to this. Huh? I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with the model that I used in my latest book, uh, saying like the minimum demand today in the market is that you need a good product, service, and price, and you need great digital convenience. Actually, these two helped us through COVID. I mean, digital convenience was what we needed and new digital models to get through it. But that's only half of the story. Um, I think that the bottom two of this model good product and service, digital convenience, creates a transactional relationship, whereas the top of the model, partner in life, which means a more in-depth customer relationship and adding value to society, creates a more emotional relationship. And the bottom two here helped you through COVID in a transactional way. The top two will have to get you through the times of high inflation. Because if you succeed today in really bringing value to the customer and to society, you can create a more emotional relationship that is more enduring that will keep people loyal to your brand at this time. Uh, help people create positive change in their life. That's the partner in life and show the world that you really care. Like imagine that you're in the restaurant business. Okay, I want to make a reservation in an easy way. That's transactional. But what if people can't afford to go to a restaurant right now? Maybe for a year, a year and a half, they won't have the money to come to your restaurant as frequent as they did. Why don't you help them out? Why don't you figure out a way how to do home deliveries in a cheaper way? Or why don't you, you know, sell the ingredients and you make a video with how to make that meal in a way that it's similar to how you would serve it in your restaurant? And if you have leftovers, how can you use those to feed people who are suffering today to you know, make ends meet? Those are the kind of things that really make a difference today. Those are the stories that will stand out. If you're in real estate, I mean, you can sell a house. That's transactional. But what if you help people? What, what if people today are really in the need to find a new house and they have a limited budget? Can you really show that you care and that you really want to fight the right house? And people who are suffering, imagine that, you, that you're a landlord, you're renting out to people. If people cannot afford to rent, can you install a system to make them overcome that short period of time because you know energy prices went up, food prices went up, just lowering the rent for a few weeks or a few months could help them out to have a decent life. Maybe we could do that. Are you willing to hurt yourself in the short run to create trust in the long run? That is the crucial question that is on everyone's plate today. And I think this offer you can't refuse model can really help to understand how to build that emotional relationship. Now, Truth is, in his model, it, it, it goes from the bottom up. Huh? So it, it won't help if you are saving the world, but if you're not helping your customer. A lot of people, especially in these tough times, a lot of people are like, it's customer first and then society second. So make sure that if you follow this, this model, that the positive change that you create goes first to the customer, and afterwards you extend that to society, not the other way around. 
But I'm convinced that this is the way forward in the long run and to win and to get out of this period as a winner, to invest in that emotional relationship with your customer. That is, in my opinion, how you will get through these times of high inflation. And, you know, just as an, as an ending note on this topic, you know, cost cutting used to be something for companies. Today, as an organization, you have to be aware of the fact that customers are also in cost cutting mode. So you have to make sure that don't, they don't cut you out of their budget. That's going to be the challenge for the next couple of months and maybe years. Who knows? I want to share the, the story of Lululemon and how they're rethinking customer loyalty. Uh, in the old days, customer loyalty was about saving points and, and you bought 10 breads and the 11th one is for free. Uh, today, customer loyalty is about you know, earning and re-earning the right for customers to stay loyal to you. And, when, and here, I want to just dive into the story of data. Uh, I, I believe we're going to enter a world where we're going to see this flip where data ownership comes back to the customer and where we have more to say about our data than we had in the past. And as an organization, you will have to make sure that you earn and re-earn the trust for people so that they grant you access to their data. And I mean, it's, it's already happening. If you look to the, the latest iOS of Apple and how easy they make it for us to not to be tracked throughout websites. And, and if you then look at the first results that like 95% of the people are asking Apple not to be tracked and the impact this has, for instance, on a company like Meta, previously known as Facebook. I mean, these guys lost 200 billion of their value in just a couple of days. And the reason is that they don't have access to that data anymore, which is a pressure on their business model. So in the near future, earning and re-earning the right to customer data is going to be crucial. And, and that's why I wanted to show this example of Lululemon. Lululemon is at first sight a retailer that is selling you know, fashionable stuff to, to work out, to go to the gym, to have a good life. But their purpose goes actually beyond that. Um, what they want to do is they want to make sure that everyone is, real, is, is realizing their full potential. Uh, so they want to make sure that you look good. And they do that in multiple ways. They have their, their fashion, they have their stores. But about a year ago, they acquired a company called Mirror, which is a tech startup uh, that allows you to do a workout from the comfort of your own home. You get your personal trainer, you get feedback from the Mirror, but you do that from the comfort of their own home. And, and at first sight, th this looks like they're changing lanes, right? They're evolving from being a fashion retailer to a technology company. Um, but if you read their purpose, you understand that there's more to that. And Lululemon has been really successful in leveraging their purpose. If, if you would have invested in them 10 years ago, your return would be like 2,400%. So they've done a pretty good job. And now they're reinventing loyalty. So what they're going to do in the next couple of months is they're going to start with their membership program. And as a member of Lululemon, you will get access to clothes, events, and fitness classes. They, they tried this out in Toronto, and it was a huge success. And now they're rolling it out to multiple markets. But if, if you think about it, I mean, it's not cheap. I mean, you, you, there's a free model, but there's also a paying model. And then you pay like $128 a month, uh, a year, which is a lot of money. Um, but they're putting a lot of value behind it. So what's happening is you get some free clothes for that, and it's almost compensating for the 128 a year but you get access to fitness classes, for instance. And what is really happening here is that you're not becoming loyal just to Lululemon, but you're becoming part of a lifestyle community that they are enabling. And I think that is really smart. And if you're part of that lifestyle community with multiple benefits for you as a customer, then of course you're gonna give your data to Lululemon because the balance is, is equal. Most of the time the balance is, is, is not in balance. I mean, the value for Facebook for using my data is much higher than the value that I get back from them. In this case of Lululemon, it is really in balance. And that's what people are looking for. I'm willing to share stuff. I'm willing to share my data. I'm willing to pay to become a loyal client if the value proposition is really, really clear. And by doing so, what they're actually doing is they are reinventing customer loyalty. You know, in the last 10 years, because of the rise of big technology companies, more and more companies were saying, 
we are a technology company, we are a data company. There's a lot of people were saying everyone is a data company, everyone is a technology company. I, I, need, I, I think we need to stop saying that. Um, because truth is that most companies are not technology companies. Most companies are not a data company. And I was really inspired by this, by this simple insight. It was like a couple of weeks ago, I was invited to give a keynote for DPG Media here in Belgium. Um, in my opinion, DPG Media is one of the leading European media companies in terms of reinventing themselves and understanding how they can leverage the possibilities of, of digital. And I had the opportunity to see a talk from their, their chairman, Christian Van Tilo. And, and he actually said it that clear. He said, guys, let's be, let's be very straight here. We are not a technology company. We are a media company. And we're a media company that really understands how to use technology to make media better. And what we really are, are a consumer cent we are a company with a consumer-centric culture. And I, I think this is the ens essence. And I really wanted to, to share it in this video because we, we need to go back to the core. We need to go back to the core. You need to understand who you really are and you're not a technology company. Go back to your passion, go back to your purpose and then use technology to, to improve it. But you know, the technology companies are so focused on tech and so focused on data that sometimes we don't really understand what their purpose and their passion is. It's like world domination. I think all other companies should look at the world differently and really think how can we make a difference? How can we create positive change for customers? How, and, and how can we be compassionate about that? And then use technology and data in the smartest possible way to increase the experience for customers. But I would recommend you never ever say again that you are a tech company if you're not a tech company. Go back to the core, go back to the passion and become this customer centric organization. That was it for this month in my monthly CX update video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening for the people who are tuning in in the podcast. Please share these stories with your friends and colleagues. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I hope to see you again next month for a new episode of my CX update. Thanks for watching.